Wow, sudden ending there. <laughs> Hello, uh, I'm Declan Moore. I'm the Chief Media Officer here at the National Geographic Society. I have the privilege of that and also to welcome you all here to the National Geographic Society here today. Uh, we believe in the power of science, exploration and storytelling to change the world. And at National Geographic we see our editorial coverage on issues such as water, population and climate change as an ongoing dialogue with our audiences which span 41 editions of the National Geographic magazine in 39 languages around the world that spans up to 450 million homes with the television presence of the National Geographic cha uh, channel. And also, of course, on the web, uh, via big web and on mobile platforms in excess of up to 30 million people on a monthly basis. So our stories build upon and complement each other offering deeper context for understanding the challenges that we face living on our planet. Our reporting on food this year has been a natural extension of this dialogue because feeding our growing world population is perhaps the greatest challenge we all face and the solutions are intertwined with how we adapt to climate change and steward the resources of this planet. Uh, our president and CEO, who regrets he can't be here with us today, is traveling, Gary Nell, recently announced that we're making food a multi-year focus for the society, where we can use the power of National Geographic to convene conversations and offer insight and perspective on what can be complicated issues. And I can think of no better partners to work with us on this initiative than the Food and Agriculture Organization. Now, our collaboration with the FAO has enriched our data reporting. And in fact, I had the pleasure of seeing uh, for myself the, the product of the wonderful marriage of data uh, and developers when we hosted a hackathon here at National Geographic some months back and turned data and technology into great stories to illuminate issues and provide potential solutions. So our collaboration involves identifying and highlighting solutions and issues that we have to keep in mind as we work to solve the challenges of feeding the world. So we're very pleased to host this important discussion about family farming and to welcome our colleagues from the FAO uh, who have organized the program for us today. So thank you very much for joining us and I'll now give you Nick Nelson, director of the FAO liaison office here in Washington, DC. Thank you. Thank you so much, Declan, for those kind words. And thanks to National Geographic for this beautiful auditorium and venue for the event. Today, we are here to discuss family farming in the 21st century. In honor of the 2014 International Year of Family Farming and World Food Day, which was last Thursday, October 16th, we hope to promote awareness of the importance of family and smallholder farmers in society. Throughout the world, Family farmers play a crucial socioeconomic, environmental, and cultural role, which, amid serious challenges, needs to be cherished and strengthened through innovation. The theme of this year's World Food Day celebrates the contribution family farmers make to food security and sustainable development. They feed the world and care for the earth. The facts presented in FAO's annual State of Food and Agriculture, SOFA, report released last week on World Food Day clearly justify the emphasis being placed on family farming. Around 500 million of the world's 570 million farms are run by families. They are the main caretakers of our natural resources. As a sector, they form the world's largest employer supply more than 80% of the world's food in terms of value, and are often the main producers of fresh food, including dairy, poultry, and pig production. At the global level, despite their important role, many family farmers, especially subsistence producers, are part of the 70% of the world's food insecure population who live in rural areas. This means that family farmers still have a great potential they can fulfill with the right support. The State of Food and Agriculture points out the challenges the sector faces and how we can work together to overcome them. From FAO's standpoint, innovation is key. Family farmers need to innovate in the systems they use. Governments need to innovate in the specific policies they implement to support family farming. Producers' organizations need to innovate to respond better to the needs of family farmers. 
and research and extension institutions need to innovate by shifting from a research-driven process predominantly based on technology transfer to an approach that enables and rewards innovation by family farmers themselves. Additionally, in all its forms, innovation needs to be inclusive, involving family farmers in the generation, sharing, and use of knowledge so that they have ownership of the process, taking on, both, on board both the benefits and the risks, and making sure that it truly responds to, to local contexts. With this event, we hope to promote awareness of the significant role of family and smallholder farmers in eradicating hunger and poverty, in providing food security and nutrition, improving livelihoods, managing natural resources, protecting the environment, and achieving <clears throat> sustainable development, in particular in those rural areas. The event will offer an opportunity to share experiences and discuss appropriate policies for sustainable development of family farming. If today's discussion challenges you to dig deeper, I encourage you to explore the State of Food and Agriculture report available on FAO's website and in the lobby near the registration desk. Also check out the Perspectives essay series, which was curated by FAO Washington office and the World Food Day Network at uh, worldfooddayusa.org on the subject of family farming. So thank you once again for joining us today for this important discussion of family farming in the 21st century. And now, it is with great, great pleasure to introduce our first keynote speaker, Dr. Sanjaya Rajaram. He is a tireless champion of eradicating hunger and malnutrition around the globe. He has the unique distinction of breeding the largest number of varieties of wheat, or any crop for that matter, in the world. Now, more than 500 improved wheat varieties planted across the globe stand testimony to his remarkable feat. All of these varieties are international public goods. Researchers, farmers, and seed producers all have free access to them. He is the former director of CIMIT, Global Wheat Program, and until just recently was the director of the Biodiversity and Integrated Gene Management Program of the International Center for, of Agricultural Research in the Dry Areas. And as you all know, is the recent 2014 World Food Prize laureate. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Sanjaya Rajaram. Thank you very much uh, for uh, inviting me here to, to talk about the family farm. Uh, a reason I felt very good coming, coming in for this one, because I do come from very small family farms in India. And uh, uh, not only that, uh, very remote areas of uh, my district. Many times, uh, the first Green Revolution helped a lot of small family farms. But it left those who were very much in the remote area, in the mountains, in the far away, even the river basins, and in the, uh, some areas which were not reachable. So that's where I want to talk about some of these things. The, as you may have realized that uh, Science Editorial very recently put some statement from M.S. Swaminathan, which had been told earlier here, the United Nations designated 2014 as the International Year of Family Farming, recognizing that an estimated 500 million family farms involving 2 billion people play a key role in the food production and consumption worldwide. This is very important that we recognize the family farms. Uh, I just wanted to remind to you the document which G20 under the presidency of Mexico in 2012 put out guidelines, gives the tremendous detailed guidelines what need to be done to small family farms. I also like to remind you that sometimes these documents are put out and then we go home and we forget about the whole thing. So the, those poor people 
who uh, 800 million so project uh, estimated go hungry remain very vulnerable and continue to remain very vulnerable uh, i also very was very pleased to see the national geographic put out recently the the future of food 2014 special reports i believe you picked up a copy it just summarizes, it gives you five points, steps. And I believe that if it is done, uh, we might solve this part of these problems. One, freeze agricultural footprints. You have to read, I don't have time to go into, describe a little bit, you got to read this thing. Two, grow more on the farms we already have. No extension of more farms, no deforestation, not no plowing up the alkaline lands and so on, but reclaiming those ones. Three, use resources more efficiently. Four, shift diets from non-vegetarian to vegetarian, okay? And you read that one, okay? <laughs> Fifth, reduce waste. I don't have to tell you about the reducing waste. We, it's a very important. I think we should go those things. There are a lot of other details there, nonetheless, I think these are, could be the pretty good, good steps for the governments, for the organizations, for the public to look at into. What I decided in, uh, uh, okay, the family farms, I'm going to talk about that in only in regards to developing countries, the developing country farms. And these are less than two hectares, but they don't, perhaps maybe five hectares, but not more than that. Multiple crops and activities, including animals, animal husbandry, they have limited access to credits and other resources. As a matter of fact, they don't have any access to credit. And the family, either head, either woman or man, is in charge of that, that operation or that family. Uh, we need very good policies to, to, to support these people. We only can talk about that, but we need the policies to go into effect so that they start making changes. Good governance, peace and stability to increase the investment. A lot of like, uh, the war zones areas, it's uh, very difficult to reach out these people. Access to land, other agricultural resources and capacity building, especially for the women, women farmer. And access, and access to credits and markets, especially roads. In the, in the, in the our little break, breakfast discussion, somebody asked, if you had two, if you had just had one minute with Mr. Obama, what would you say? I said, build the roads, provide the credits and the knowledge. I think we can solve that problems. Access to improved technology and the knowledge, especially for women farmers, including advanced seeds. I want to say here that I cannot differentiate the technology, advanced technology, which the big farmers and corporations use, and the technology which would be needed by these very small farmers. They need those ones if they're going to change. If you want to keep the traditional technology for them to follow, we basically preaching poverty in per perpetuity. They will remain poor. They have done for thousands and thousands of years. So they need good invention on the ground. So please make this point. Okay, also I'm not, uh, I think they are the role for advanced technology and also the organic farming, hand in hand. So, so everything can be used to help them. Support to farmer associations and cooperative. I think they and the companies. I think we can, we, not changing. 
Okay. To, um, we can bring these farmers way to bring these farmers, small farmers together. Contract farming with the larger farmers would help them. So what I'm going to do here, I know that there, I believe there are hundreds inter, inventions, hundreds of inventions, maybe thousands at the specific community level, village level, which can be applied to improve the conditions of these small farms. I cannot list them here all, but I want to take few selected examples which they upscaled. They may be just followed by one farmer or two farmers and not reachable to hundreds of farmers, simply because the credit, as I said that earlier, what are the limiting things? If those are upscaled at the village level in those remote area, I believe, I believe we can solve a lot of problems. And I'm going to give five, six examples. It's not moving anymore. Oh. Okay, I t take an example. The experiments conducted by Nepalese in National Agricultural Agriculture and Semit under the funding of USAID and SD SDC in the hill farmers for the maize, for the maize cultivation, promotion of maize technology. New variety, just new, one new variety, Sayama Manakamana 3 versus local variety was 60% sup superior in most of the experiments conducted in that. And what the experiment, the way the experiment was designed, that the, some of the farmers in the community were taught how to produce improved seed. So it can be given to the neighbors, can be sold to the neighbors once the technology was good, but the locally produced. No, I'm, I'm just uh, one ahead, or oh, going on that one. It all got mixed up. very much wanted to bring to your attention in Mexico, Toluca Valley. This is the considered land of origin of maize. There are a lot of sentimentality involved. There are land races, thousands of land races, all the way in central Mexico and the southern Mexico. But here is the fact. Introduction of hybrid maize in that area has produced in the large scale up to seven to eight tons per hectare, compared to the local variety, which is only two tons per hectare. The, and I'll show you some of the picture why they are. The, what, is the, what is the problem that the, we cannot take hybrid maize in that area? The cost of seed and inputs. The seed is costly, it requires a little bit higher inputs compared to the local maize. But look at the cost of her. The, it basically it costs 2,000 pesos per uh, one hectare seed, per the seed per one hectare, which is roughly 160 United States dollar. But then if applied, the net profit small farmer can have very much like 16, $1,640 per hectare in the same land, one hectare piece of land. It is a tremendous boost to his family, sending his children to educate, for schools, 
buying their clothes, etc., etc. This makes tremendous difference. Uh, wait a minute, I'm doing wrong. Here, here is the hybrid maze in Toluca Valley. It can go anywhere in central Mexico as well. They look tremendous. They yield seven tons. And, and here's the, what you will compare with the local criollo farmers without application of good seed and technology. One ton to two tons, because this tall maize will, will uh, come out large. It, it does produce very good carb. Nonetheless, it's heavy. It's five meter tall sometime and comes out. And that hybrid maize, if upscaled in Toluca Valley and elsewhere, that might solve the Mexico's food, food problems on the maize, which is a high, secure, high food security crop for them. I also wanted to uh, tell you another story. About the Bangladesh serial improvement program, also, also done by, is done by uh, USDA and University of Missouri. Bangladesh is generally Bangladesh, and perhaps the the, the most eastern state of India, uh, West Bengal. They're very much deficient in in boron. I'll let you know what, I tell you what boron does. Boron doesn't, you don't look at plant come out very vigorous, have high biomass, it doesn't affect very much. But at the flowering time, because of the boron deficiency, the, the pollen grains are sterile. So there's no grain. Depending on the level of deficiency, the sterility can be 10%, 15%, or can be as high as 90%. I've seen that. And just uh, these experiments done by USDA and University of Missouri, one kg of boron per hectare at the planting time. For all the crops except rice, Somehow rice does not respond to boron deficiency. I have some resistance. Yield increase of at least 20% over the Czech variety. One kg of boron in the local market will cost 1,000 taka. Can't tell you in dollars, but local money. But I, I don't think it's very costly. And farmers had 9,000 takas net profit if they invested that 1,000 taka. Yield increases were for all the crops except rice. A lot of uh, tremendous boost in the wheat production because it was just application. Some of the farmers in Bangladesh, another very interesting experiment i like to describe that to you. Promoting grass pea. Grass pea varieties, the legumes, in the state of Bihar, West Bengal, Chhattisgarh, and UP in India. This experiment was man widely conducted, managed by ICARDA and ICAR of India. They were able to reach 5,160 small marginal where in the boondock country, farmers. And, um, and uh, interestingly, 16,000 Adibasis, these are the tribal farmers. They, their numbers in India are 80 million people. Believe me if you want to know, and maybe my colleague will, uh, from India will, perhaps Dr. Srivastava here will agree. These are 80 million people. They're the most depressed people in it, when we talk about hunger out of 200 million, just 80 million are those. 
they, they had the hunter gatherers uh, life but modern agriculture basically have limited them they cannot do that and uh, but the grass they grow grass pea just after rice just after rice it's very dry grass pea does very very well provides the biomass and beauty of this one that has 29 percent protein is basically just like meat and so these farmers the, the, these are grass pea farmers in those areas can benefit tremendously but one thing we have to do grass pea also had a toxin what Ricardo did through conventional plant breeding reduced the toxin to a level that it is a non-toxic to the people they can eat before they could not eat. It's not only tox toxic to people, but also to animals. Uh, gray water family farming. Uh, uh, you, water harvesting worldwide is one of the greatest thing ever invented, I think, now. We have, have to upscale that. We need water. We need water to do something. This is, I've taken the example of uh, the Jardin from Prof Dr. Mahmoud Sola, Director General of Icarda. Productive use of gray water in homes and family farming is very important, especially olive growing. You can deep irrigate the olives and have the bumper harvest. It's a very important part of those people there. Goat management and feeding in Afghanistan and Pakistan. These are mostly women farmers. Dairy hygiene and processing improved skills and income of at least 600 women in this, in, in this project. Three, three times benefits with supplemental feeding of goats, two times benefit by improved feeding during patterning, three times increase in kid, kid survival due to vaccinations, improved goat through grass breeding of goats. Goats are very good adapted to those areas. I think I have one more technological intervention to say the simple urea deep placement reduced, reduces 78, 78 to 100, 150 kg uh, uh, nitrogen reduced by 78 to 150 kg for the, the rice planting. Paddy yield increased by nine, 900 to one ton, one ton per hectare. Our net, net return on these practices were $188 per, per hectare. This is FAO data, I have cited a lot of FAO data. My last side is that the CGIR Harvest Plus program took up the took up the project of what they call Harvest Plus. Basically, you increase the vitamin A, iron deficiency, and the zinc in the grains. This is an example of cassava. The second column is the, the daily requirement, percent daily requirement, and the target country. They have they have targeted all the crops, 21 major crops, but I feel that they made tremendous progress bringing, putting these genes for these elements and the high yield potential for the vitamin A in cassava, iron in beans, vitamin in maize, iron pearl millets, zinc in rice and zinc in wheat in different places. I mean, they, you, could, you could imagine how, how this can help. At one time, we thought that we can provide the pills, everything would be okay, but you know that it, it hasn't happened very much. I do believe my time is up, so thank you very much.